All right, everybody good? Everybody chilling? Call a little. Yeah, good question. So, um, so about that, Ashley, Ashley couldn't make it today, uh, so I'm going to be doing this presentation on effective Git. Um, so I gave a presentation with Tenchi a little while about GDD. Some of you may have heard of it if you're into a one right now. Uh, James plugged it for me. Shout out, James. Um, it was a good presentation. I liked it, and it covered about how to use that tool in a little bit more depth than you get from class. And so we're going to talk about how you can use Git, how you can use it really well, how you can cut down on problems that come up, and you can just be really fast with it. So it's a little bit of a learning curve, more than you get in class, but it's not as bad compared to the benefit that you get. Like It really checks out. So we'll get started. All right, so, so these are the two presenters for today. Um, yeah, that's, uh, that's all I'm going to say, actually, for this one. Uh, Ashley, Ashley couldn't hear her. She's a, she's a big gamer. Um, this is Forger, an FFR, FFRDC worker, okay, longtime FFRDC enjoyer, and an Argo Tunnel poster, believe it or not. So, yeah. That's not going, is it? That's not going at all. Okay. That's kind of an L. I'm going to be honest with you guys. Is that still? Whoa. That was like, that was like a, uh, that, that was uh, that was like a really long transition. We're gonna keep going. All right, um, so I wanna just do a quick little poll. Uh, how many of you guys have ever had a problem with Git before? This is really slow, man. Raise your hand, keep them up until the slide changes. Okay, <laughs> so Git, um, one thing that we want to cover first before we try and use it, uh, we're going to cover what Git is. So what Git is, it's a version control system. So what that means is you have something that you're trying to keep track of. There are different versions of it. Um, you make different changes. You add stuff. You take stuff out. And you have different uh, branches um, all throughout that system. So you probably have been using one branch in class. Um, that's, that's pretty cool. Um, you can also use more than one branch. Um, so in this diagram here, like the red one would be like your main branch. And then these other ones going off are like features and stuff. Um, so basically it helps you keep track of your, it could be code, just any kind of text really. Um, Git is also a distributed version control system. Um, so basically what that means is uh, it's more like the one on the right than on the left. So on the left, you have a centralized thing. Everybody has to connect to the same spot. If it's decentralized, it just means there's more than one spot to connect to. Um, but a fully distributed system is when everybody has their own copy of the code or whatever you're working on. Um, if it sounds really complicated, it's because it kind of is. But usually what this means in practice is there's going to be some kind of center that you end up connecting to. The point is everybody has their own copy of the entire history on their device. Um, so Git is a little complicated. Uh, there are a lot of lessons in like user experience that can be learned uh, from looking at the Git man pages. I can assure you that. Um, so if it's a little complicated, if it doesn't make a lot of sense, that's okay because we are we're just covering a lot of different stuff right now, um, and a lot of it's just not going to really gel the first time. So give this presentation a rewatch, look at some docs, try stuff out yourself, um, and just pick up as much as you can. We'll answer some questions at the end. All right. So there was we're going to cover some rules. One number one rule is that almost all Git issues that you've had or ever will have can be avoided completely uh, with good processes. Okay, there's a big difference between evasion and avoiding. Um, ask your local account with that, and uh, just keep that in mind. Okay, so our first command, uh, many of you have used it, git clone. Uh, it makes a local clone of a remote repository. So you give it a remote. Uh, in this case, it's called test repo or XYZ. Um, so these examples, uh, first we're cloning it down. Uh, this will create, the first example will create a test repo in your like, current directory. You can clone it to any path you want and put it on your dot files. Uh, depth equals one is a fun one where you only get the last commit instead of all the previous ones. Uh, so if you have a really large repository like Linux or Kubernetes or something, uh, that can be very helpful. And you can also do what's called a bare repository. It just means that you can't edit it directly. So if you think about like, the Git repository being hosted on GitHub or on GitLab, it's a bare repository because no one actually logs into that box and like works on there. The ones that you have are not going to be that way, um, but if you know that you're not going to develop on that box, you can just use a bare repository for people to push changes to. And so we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail as we get to that. Um, 
But before we commit anything, we have to add it. So Git has these two terms you should be aware of. One is called your working tree. It's a very technical term. But really what this means is like your directory. This is where you actually edit files. Um, and so when you look at Git status, that's what's read um, you know, when you haven't added stuff yet. And your staging area is where your stuff gets pushed when you add to it. So if you do git add, uh, it'll move it from your working tree to your staging area. This is what you'll see in the man page, so I'm going through the terms right now, but um, that's really all that means. It's where you're adding your changes to. So you can add a whole bunch of different things. You can add individual files. You can add an entire directory. You can add just a bunch of text files that are under some directory. It's pretty um, sophisticated, but that's really all you need to know about adding stuff. Once you've added it, you'll commit it. Um, so just a quick follow-up question. What actually is a commit? Anybody know? Right up. What up, Brad? I see you. What's a commit, dude? Commit is a list of modifications to Well, that's pretty close. A get is the entire history at a given point. So this is a really big distinction if you look at Mercurial Online or some other version control system. Don't do that, it's a waste of time. But if you do that, uh, it'll have a whole bunch of diffs as like your changes. The important thing about a commit is that it's actually the entire history of your project or whatever project you're working on at that point, some point in time. Um, what that means is when you clone a single, like depth equals one, a single commit, that's gonna have the entire project. It won't just have the changes with the previous one. Git will show you uh, a diff so that you can kind of understand what the difference is between one commit and another. But that commit is actually the entire history. And that's a really important thing um, when you start to do more advanced stuff. So it has the entire history of that project at one point. Every commit is going to have a parent, except for the first one. And commits in Git can be pointed to by a lot of different things. One of these is called head. Raise your hand if you've seen head in like your Git output. Um, keep your hand raised if you know what head is. OK. So the head is your, basically it's a pointer to the current branch that you're on. Um, basically, if you're making changes to a branch, maybe like a main branch, head is going to point to the commit that you're working on. And if you keep on making commits there, head will move along. Um, then you have additional branches. Branches could, um, branches can actually point to a commit. All that really is, is it's like a name for a commit. Uh, it's a very, you know, that's all it is, it's just a pointer to some commit. Same thing goes for tags. If you've ever seen like a version of a program, maybe version 1.0 or 1.1, uh, those are usually implemented as get tags, and get tags are just pointers to commits. So all you really need to know to understand get is what a commit is, uh, what a branch is, and head and tag. That all are just pointers to your commits. So yeah, that's pretty much um, what I'm talking about here. Um, and tags are mostly used for versioning, so. Branches are used as like a place that you uh, contribute to. Um, maybe it's a feature, maybe it's just one version of the code, um, whereas a tag is like a specific version number. Um, so this is an example of what a repository looks like. Um, you can think of this as like a high-level overview. Uh, each commit, as you can see, is a snapshot. It's not just a diff, it's an entire history snapshot of your repository. Um, and at the top here, you have a whole bunch of pointers. So head is pointing to master. Um, that means that you're working on the master branch. This is pulled straight from the git docs, by the way. Um, we have a tag as well, version 1.0, that's pointing to the most recent commit. So we're basically saying that the most recent commit F3 is the uh, version 1.0 of that software. Um, so yeah, really all this stuff is is just pointers. Just think about commits as discrete like snapshots of that uh, software that are you know chained together. Uh, so we can run git init to actually create a repository on the command line. You might not have done this if you're just cloning from GitHub. Um, but the important thing here when you do this is that it doesn't create any remote hosts. You're not going to be able to push to GitHub if you just init a repository without some additional changes. Um, so that's basically uh, git basics. Um, we'll talk a little bit about diffs. Um, so diffs are, they show differences between two commits, right? So we were talking about this commit as the entire history. Well, how do we change, how do we compare two histories? Um, we use diff. And so you can do get diff on your current directory. You can also do with branches. So you can say, okay, I have the auto releases branch. Uh, compare that to the Abort branch on the remote. The remote is called origin and that might be GitHub, it might be GitLab. Origin is the name that you set yourself. 
Um, but it's also the default name for Node if you've never added one. Um, so this is just saying, hey, we have the auto releases branch. See what the Abor branch changes to or changes on that. If you were to take the two and like merge them together, uh, that's what it will look like. Whenever you work in Git, uh, you're going to be checking out a branch. So it might be a commit, it might be a tag. You can use any of the different pointer types, but it's basically, hey, I'm going to work on this commit from now on. So here's an example of branching if you've never used it before. Let's say I have a project and I want to create a new feature. I want to add some kind of feature to that project, and I want people to give me some feedback before I merge it in. So what you do is you create a branch. Uh, you say, hey, I have this new feature. I'm going to check out that branch, which means, hey, I used to be on stable. Uh, now I'm on the new feature branch. We're going to make our changes. That's what step two is. You know, whatever changes we want to add, whatever we need to do to implement this feature. We add and commit that to the new feature branch. Um, so what this means is you haven't changed the main branch or the stable branch at all. If someone clones it down, your stuff is not going to be broken. This is your own private history. You can experiment on the new feature branch. You can do 100, 1,000 commits. You can do whatever you want. Um, so you can see this too when you run git log. Um, you'll see that, hey, head is pointing at new feature. Why is head pointing there? Because we checked it out. Uh, if we do git checkout, head will point to that new branch that you're on. Um, and we'll see here that the added feature is basically a, another commit on top of the initial one. So if we have different branches, you could have 10 or 20 people working on different features on this project, all on their own separate branches. At some point, you have to merge those together so that people can actually use those features, right? So merging basically says, okay, I'm on some branch. Maybe it's stable. Maybe it's main. I have another branch that has some cool feature. I want to take that branch and put it on top of mine. In other words, take all the changes and apply them to what I'm working on. So this is an example of what a merge looks like. We have this new feature that we added. Um, very cool. We're excited to merge it in. And we switch back to the stable branch. You always want to switch back to the branch that you're merging on top of. Um, so it's saying, OK, we have this feature branch. Let's merge it on top of the one we're on. Uh, and we see here it's only a one-line change. And it does what's called a fast forward merge. It just means that there's no conflict. So you just add all your stuff, and it works fine. Uh, this is what you want to see. And we can see now in the Git log, if we run that again, uh, it's applied both to the new feature branch where we put it on originally, and it's applied on top of stable. So you have all these cool commits on your local device. We talked about how Git is distributed. Uh, well, it's not so fun if it's just on your laptop. You want to actually release that to GitHub, or you want to release it to wherever you're pushing your code to. So Git push will take all those commits that are on your uh, device and will actually push them to a remote uh, repository. So that could be GitHub, that could be somebody else's computer. Uh, it's just taking those commits that you've made and applying them to a remote repository instead of a branch on your local device. So here is how that works at uh, a sort of high level. Um, remember when we ran git init, we didn't add a remote. Um, so the git doesn't know where to push your code by default. Uh, and if it doesn't, you can add it with the git remote add command. So if you've ever seen this copy pasted from like, if you create a brand new repository on GitHub, it'll tell you to like run a bunch of commands that look like this. And what this is saying is add a new remote. We're calling it origin. That could be any name you want, but usually people call it origin. And we are basically going to push it to GitLab, our RIT6 uh, GitLab instance. And so once you add that, you can run tacd and see, hey, uh, we can fetch and push to that remote. Um, all good. After that, it's just a matter of actually pushing the changes. And if you provide, you can provide no arguments, and it'll say, hey, I don't know where to push this. Like, what branch do you want me to put this on? Um, and if it doesn't know, you can just add it uh, when you push. You can say, push to origin, our remote, and we want to push it on origin's stable branch. So basically, GitLab might not have, GitLab's version might not have the stable branch, so we want to push it to there. So it has it. And there's a couple ways this could fail. One of them is if you don't have permissions um, or network connectivity. And the main one that people run into is if you don't have the latest changes. So if you make a bunch of cool features and then somebody else pushes a bunch of cool features and you don't pull down theirs first, your changes don't have those cool features that that other person wrote. And so you might try and overwrite them or it'll actually just block you from doing that. You can force push, do not do that. Uh, if you do that, then your coworkers uh, lose their changes. So yeah, basically, if you get a failure message, it's probably because you don't have the changes. 
So you can get pull them down, get fetch, and get merge. We talked about merging. Um, there's this other really cool command called rebasing. Um, this is really, really useful when you start working with more than one person. Um, and so that's probably a big reason why some of you might not have heard of it. So let's consider an example. We have a whole bunch of commits here. Master is on C5. And somebody made a really cool feature and they branched it off of C2 and they're calling it experiment. It's an experimental feature. The problem is that C5 has a whole bunch of features that they want, but they branch it off of C2. They don't have any idea what C3 and 5 are. Um, so we want to make sure that experiment um, is synced back up with master over here. So what you would do is you would check it out. First you move over to that branch. We're going to edit that branch so we check it out first. And then afterwards we say, okay, well, we want to rebase it. Basically, instead of basing it on C2, base it on whatever master is pointing to. So you could rebase it to a pin version. You could rebase it onto a commit hash. You can rebase it wherever you want. Um, but in this case, we're saying, okay, we want to catch it up with master. Base our changes in our experimental branch off of the newer version. After that, um, that looks pretty good, but we want to actually move master ahead now. We want them to be in sync. And so what we do is we check out master, we go back to master, and then we merge experiment. So we say, okay, take um, this experimental branch, take C3 and C4 prime, I guess, and merge them together into one. So rebasing is really, really helpful when you have a bunch of people working on different things uh, because very often they will not be basing their changes off of the latest branch. It might be the latest when they based it, but then two weeks pass, a whole bunch of changes get added, they need to rebase their changes. So that's all a rebase is. They're different uh, than a merge, but if you have inconsistencies on stuff, you'll want to make sure that whatever changes you make to like a public project, for instance, are actually based off of the master branch or the main branch or wherever they're storing like the true copy of their software. So we talked a little bit about the basics, but I want you guys to be effective. I want you to be very you know, in tune with your tools. You want to be confident and sure that you're not going to be breaking things. And honestly, just not pulling a bunch of time on you know, really big issues that come up from you know, a lot of really bad guides out there, to be honest. So we're going to add two more rules to do that. Um, Git and using it effectively is really all about following a couple of guiding principles. Um, you want to create branches for all your changes. So if you're making a change to a piece of software, you're making a change to some Ansible, you're making some changes to your resume tool, you want to create a branch for that change so that if you start pushing it to the main branch, it doesn't overwrite somebody else's work. It doesn't break everything for someone else. You have your own branch where you can experiment, do crazy stuff, and it won't affect anybody else's work. And the other big thing is you want your commits to be very, very, very small. So if you enable a config setting, that should be a commit. If you change the way that some algorithm works in one function, make that a commit. Don't uh, commit four or five different things into one big commit because if someone wants to revert that change, that means they're going to revert more than what they're trying to revert. So in theory, your commits should do one thing. Uh, and what that really means is, can somebody revert this without breaking a whole bunch of other stuff? So web. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. So the, the ideal state is if your commits can all be reverted with Git. Um, that might not always be the case, but you want to always do your best so that that way, hopefully you won't have to yeah, fix it by hand. Um, but ultimately, yeah, you should really think about what you're committing. Spend an extra few seconds before you cause a problem later. Uh, so what this really means, let's say you want to add a change to a piece of software. This is your workflow, what you're going to do from start to finish so that you can do it effectively and you can do it without breaking someone's work. So you want to identify whatever you want to change, um, figure out what that is. Maybe you want to optimize something, you want to add an extra flag, whatever that is for you. You're going to implement that change on your local device, on your laptop or something. Make that change, test the code out. The project does have tests, hopefully. You run those tests, make sure it all works. And then afterwards, or you could even do it before, you create a branch, um, and that's going to be your feature branch. So when you push this somewhere to GitHub for somebody else to review, it'll be on that branch for them. You're going to commit all your changes to that branch, not to main or stable or wherever, but to your specific feature. You're going to push that branch to whatever remote you're using. You know That could be uh, GitLab or GitHub. It could even just be someone's email address. Uh, the important thing is that it's not to stable or main or master or some other branch that is the true version of that software, right? Whatever one people or users are downloading on. After that, you have a branch on the remote. 
Uh, so if you're on GitHub, you open a pull request, GitLab calls them merge requests. Git was really built for like email. So in many cases, that's just like sending an email. If you're working on like the Linux kernel, it still works this way. Um, you make your changes, you send an email to a mailing list, and some mailing list uh, person reviews it, hopefully constructively. And of course, we don't make any mistakes here at Ritzek, so someone merges that for you, because you're the best, and you don't make any, don't make any errors. It's an awesome change, just a little bit. They merge it for you, and what that means is, well, great. All you have to do now, you just check out main or whatever the true version is, and you pull your own changes back. Make sure that you're working on the latest stuff always. So yeah, that's the real like step zero here, is always pull the changes um, before you start working. We covered a lot of stuff here. Um, branches are really awesome. I recommend that you guys take some time to just mess around with them. Open some pull requests on your own projects. Make sure you understand how that works. But here's some of the stuff that if you've worked a little bit with Git, you might not know about. So Git has this really cool thing called the ref log. Um, what the ref and ref log means is reference. It could be a commit hash. It could be a branch. It could be a tag. And this is a log of all of the commits across all branches in your repository. So I circled this one here called awesome feature. If you were really eagle-eyed, you noticed that I never talked about a commit that had a message that said awesome feature. And that's because I deleted it like a while ago. It's on a branch that I got rid of like quite a while before. Um, and so it's just still here in the Git ref log. Um, even if you delete something in Git, if it's committed somewhere on your local device, you can get it back. And you'll do it through the, the ref log. So if I show that feature, um, that little commit hash, I can see this is my feature. It's the same one that I added, on, but on a different branch that I deleted. And you can see the commit hash and the author. You see the date, timestamp. Don't pay too much attention to the timestamp. Um, but after that, if you've done, you know, maybe you've done a little bit of work with Git and you find yourself spending way too much time making small commits. I know what some of you all are thinking, like, hey, I think of a whole bunch of things, I implement them all. I don't want to like remove the change, add the file, put the change back, commit it, just to make things really small and tidy. What you can do is this thing called granular staging. Once you learn how to do this, you might never not do it. Um, but basically what it is, is let's say you have a file, you make a whole bunch of changes to like three different functions. You want them all to be separate commits so that it's easy to revert later. What you do is you can actually choose which lines you want to add into your commit. You can say, hey, I just want like lines three and five from the readme and like six and 10 from you know, main.py. And that can be your commit. Um, and you can keep on doing that. You can really make very granular changes. And that way, if you want to change anything later, it's very easy. So yeah, I, I started using this and it's honestly, I haven't looked back. It's a pretty, pretty awesome feature. Um, but when you run it, you get some output like this. It says like, hey, do you want to stage this part? Um, they call them hooks for some reason, but yeah. You can also run your own git command. Uh, so there's like git add and commit and all those ones. You can actually create your own. Um, so all you have to do is you create a git dash whatever you want to call it. And it should be under your path, so like user local or something like that. And then you can run like git something in this case. Um, so when I was at work, I had this idea, like I'm always typing git add, but I type it in wrong all the time and I write git dad. And I, it's like really annoying. It's on my work laptop and I like, I don't know. I was thinking like, well, if I write git dad, it should tell me a dad joke. Um, and somebody actually already thought of this. I found out somebody had the exact same idea like several months before me, and I found this on GitHub. Um, so what this does is you put this under git dash dad in your path, and then when you run git dad, it'll add all your stuff in, and then it will, if you give it some arguments, it'll actually just curl down a dad joke from the public API. So yeah, um, you can do git commands for whatever you want. Uh, it's sort of like a little known fact. It's pretty fun. Um, so. Yeah, you can kind of go nuts with that. It can just be a shell script, it can be a program, whatever you uh, want. Let's say, another scenario, you're working on some feature and uh, something really bad happens. You have to fix something in production. Um, never had to do that on Black Team. But you know, let's say you have to do that hypothetically. Right? Um, and somebody has a cool branch where they're fixing that. It's one of your teammates, one of your coworkers is working on this. Well, what you can do is you can take that commit, which is hopefully small and easy to revert or add, and you can cherry pick it, which basically just means take that specific commit and put it on a my branch. That commit could be from like years ago. Um, the idea is you keep your commits really small and then you can just cherry pick them as you want. If you want to add a specific change, like let's say you want to just like disable a flag or disable some config file or whatever, um, it can be on a commit somewhere, maybe somewhere really far in the past, you look on the ref log and it's like, fix this bug. 
you can cherry pick that onto your main branch or your production or whatever, it works fine. So this is really helpful if you have some thing that is way far in the past that you don't want to like pull an entire branch for, you can just take one specific commit and overlay the changes onto your current copy. Um, another common problem is like, let's say you forget about something while you're working. You make all these changes and then you're like, well, I have to pull new ones or I have to switch branches or something. You don't want to copy all those files into another directory because it's kind of a hassle. Um, so what you can do is you can run git stash and if you give it no arguments, it'll take all the files you've edited and just stash them into like the ether. And they'll just be somewhere, I don't know where, but you can get them back later with git stash pop. It works kind of like a stack. So you just take all your changes, toss them into the ether, uh, Narnia or whatever, work on something, uh, go back to that branch, and then you can pop them onto whatever branch you're on. So this is really helpful. You don't want to maybe, if you've ever had that like commit something to memory or like move it you know, to another directory, you don't have to do that anymore. Git stash will save you. Um, another common uh, misconception on Black Team, apparently, is that if you change the branch and you go into a team up session or you open Vim or you I don't know, do the hokey pokey and turn yourself around, it won't change the branch for everyone else on your box. So let's say that you're all logging into a deploy box, hypothetically, right? And you want to work on different branches. You can do that with work trees. And what that means is each directory is a branch. So this is actually how we built IRSec. We had separate work trees for every branch. Like Orca SMTP, that's the branch that we worked on the mail server. Um, Squid AD is the domain controller. You can just CD into these directories and then you're onto that branch. Um, and then once you're done, you can just uh, you know, merge them back in at the end. So it's really helpful if you're trying to share a, like a box that you're all SSH'd into, because then you can just work on those branches without like changing them out from someone else. If you're working on a, uh, a Git you know, project, it's pretty complicated sometimes if you're not doing this and you're trying to all be on the same box. Last big feature is Git bisect. Um, so let's say that some bug is in your software and you don't know where it came from. You know when it used to work and you know when it stopped working. Well, you can do a Git bisect. And basically what this means is you choose a bad commit, you choose a good one, and it goes right smack in the middle and it asks you, does this, is this the bug that you're seeing? It chooses a commit right in the middle from like those two points. And if it is, you say that it's get set by sec bad. Like this is a bad one. Uh, otherwise you say it's good. And you basically keep on doing this and it will keep on splitting in half and basically doing binary search with your commit history um, based on the feedback that you give it. You can script this too. So I saw this really cool blog post. This guy found a bug in the Linux kernel. He didn't know where it was. So he wrote a little script to run git bisect, and after like 30 minutes, it automatically told him the exact commit from like six months prior from some random guy that is causing his like, I don't know, box to crash or something. So git bisect is really cool when you know you have a bug, but you don't know exactly what caused it, and you want to track it down. Um, so yeah, I have an open dictionary here, because that's basically what it's doing is binary search. Opens it up halfway, checks in the middle, and repeats uh, until it eventually finds the exact point where you caused that issue. Git also has hooks. Um, Git can run scripts. So if you run a commit, you can have a script automatically execute, um, which is cool. Maybe you want to do formatting on your code before you push it to GitHub. You can automatically run the formatting when you commit. That way you don't actually have to keep on formatting your own stuff. It'll always happen. You don't have to think about it. And there's a whole bunch of different client-side hooks. You can do it after, before or after commits, before or after rebases. There's tons. And there are plenty of resources online. Um, if you didn't like this talk, I'm sorry. If you did like this talk, I'm happy to hear it. But there are plenty of better resources on the internet. Pro Git is what I pulled a lot of the graphics from. There's a site called Dang It Git um, that's based off of another website that I didn't want to put on here um, that uh, has a whole bunch of like get out of jail free cards and like one-liners for like how to fix specific issues. So I do recommend that site a lot. And there's a couple of good talks on YouTube about how Git actually works which are kind of interesting. I don't think you really need to watch them to like be a good like Git person, but um, they can tell you a little bit about how some things were designed, and that can be a little helpful if you're kind of stuck with like why these things work the way they do. I'm happy to take questions. We have some Q&A questions. Uh, what is the difference between GitHub and GitLab? Good question. Um, so GitHub and GitLab are two different places you can push code to. Um, you could use your own server. It could be a Linode 
like digital ocean droplet that has SSH enabled. That could be your remote. Um, and you just SSH in and push the commits there automatically. It doesn't actually have to be on GitHub or GitLab, but they're just two different places that you can use to store stuff. They have nice little convenience features like pull requests so that people can like automatically you know, discuss how things are going. You can discuss your changes, say, hey, is this a good idea? You can leave comments on GitHub and GitLab. Um, you can also automatically run tests and like see how code runs and stuff like that. Um, but really, they're just two different providers for the same thing. Okay. Um, any other questions? No, we can stop here. We got All right, big claps. Big claps. Here we go. <laughs> yeah, if you have any questions, if you have any questions, feel free to them. Um, I'm not like a Git expert, but I spent a ton of time learning this stuff out of necessity. So, um, yeah, don't uh, don't take the the hard road if you don't have to. Um, but yeah, thanks for thanks for coming in. Welcome back.